The world seems to be in a state of decadence. Between the new wave of fascism, irreversible climate change, and strenuous relationships between major world powers all armed with nuclear warheads, it seems that there is very little we can do. However, amongst this international strife, politicians and, and members of the bourgeoisie insist on preserving a future for our children. These political figureheads use the child as a means of encouragement to continue progress on an ever-decaying planet. However, this political motif of the child serves for a far more insidious project of the state, and that is its destruction and erasure of queer life. The child here serves as a replacement for the future, and is routinely deployed to convince the working class that the child is in danger of destruction due to the existence of queerness. The state has deemed us criminals, and charged us with the destruction of Western civilization, a crime punishable by, de by death. The nation-state coerces its population to advocate and pitch in towards this erasure so that the child may be allowed to survive. The state accomplishes this persuasion through subtle policy changes in education, the normalization of being cisgendered and heterosexual, and the protection of the nuclear family as a monolith of productivity and correct citizenship. This method of relying on the image of the child as a call to action for a defense of the state is better known as reproductive futurism and is primarily used in erasing queer individuals from the margins of history to better reify its tactics and not only sedating but normalizing the working class into a perfect cycle of reproduction of laborers that they can further exploit. This video will attempt to analyze the usage of reproductive futurism as well as the child and its ability to persuade the public to agree with inhumane actions done by the state and our response as queer individuals against this violence so that we may better resist the state. When analyzing this political phenomenon known as the child, it is important to know that I do not refer to a literal child. Rather, the child refers to a political motif used as a replacement for future-oriented politics. The child serves as a symbol of the beauty of the future to come if we allow the state to expand itself, and as such, it is a future that must be protected at all costs. The state consistently deploys this child as a call to action to defend the state from its supposed enemies. Perhaps the most infamous example of this is the Daisy Child advertisement, and an attack ad ran against Republican nominee Barry Goldwater in the 1960s, wherein a small girl is seen plucking a daisy in a field, counting down the petals as she plucks them off. Her voice is gradually overridden by the countdown of a nuclear launch sequence as a large mushroom cloud fills the screen and the deafening roar of an explosion overrides all other senses. It is at this point that a voice chimes in, saying these are the consequences. This ad struck up controversy as the clear implication was that without thinking and voting the correct way, the viewer was responsible for the death of this innocent girl. This construction of the child as a figure of frailty and innocence is meant to strike a chord with the audience so that it may promote sympathies for the nation-state's efforts against the forces that seek to destroy Western civilization and capitalism, and to get the people to let the state achieve this by any means necessary. Even more insidious, possibly, is the way the child is constructed as a figurehead of heteronormativity and whiteness, because the future of civility must rely on a person that is able to reproduce labor for capitalism and laborers that are able to submit themselves and willing to be docile in the face of oppression, or else the destruction of capitalism is inevitable. Personifying these values in the form of a child in danger of, say, complete nuclear annihilation serves to promote fear in the hearts of the viewers. For the realm of the political, this frames a narrative of one group being the defender of the child and the other group the proponents of its destruction. This fear of the child being destroyed serves as a call to action to protect it by destroying all those who oppose it. But not just destroying these proponents of degeneracy is enough, no, not by any means. We must seek to erase them and whatever ideology they offer to ensure that it is never heard from again. So, who is this threat to the state? Who above all else serves to benefit from the collapse of the state and the erasure of Western civilization? The state offers us queers as the answer. We are posed as monsters towards this child because, at least in the normative sense, we cannot reproduce to continue the cycle of laborers to give towards capitalism. 
Because of this, the state deems us as illegitimate, and is why that up until recently, the punishment for homosexuality was forced chemical transitioning and extensive therapy to cure this disease. Because of course, an unwillingness to submit to capitalism is just that in the eyes of the bourgeoisie, a disease that must be cured or eliminated. Of course, as time moves on, operations and mechanisms of power must change in order to survive. Around the 19th and 20th centuries especially, a massive social upheaval was taking place in various forms with the increased discourse of civil rights, the sexual revolution, and the rise of post-structuralist areas of theory, along with the critique of essentialism all geared towards the critique of the authoritarian state. It was here that for the state to survive, it had to find ways to maintain its control of the working class while doing so in a more discreet fashion. This is where I would posit that biopolitics became the choice means of control over the proletariat, and as such, policies and positions of power came to reflect this. Biopolitics and biopower, for those who don't know, is a theory proposed by Michel Foucault, which refers simply to a more individualistic modality of control and power over groups of people under a state. The most glaring form of this subtle influence on the mind of the proletariat is in our education. Elizabeth Mayer incisively described the policies in place that influence children towards the heteronormative standards that the bourgeois state craves. These include, but are not limited to, quote, questions of censoring literature that represents same-sex families in a positive light, to educators being fired for being gay, lesbian, or bisexual, to the rights of student groups to meet and discuss issues relating to relationships, sexuality, and sexual orientation, to students being violently and repeatedly harassed with homophobic taunts and slurs, end quote. The state here attempts to discreetly construct the rights of queerness to operate and be discussed in education for fear of having students question their gender or sexuality, or the state's right to assign their identities in the first place. Because, of course, the state disseminates information with the sole purpose of influencing people's identity towards a productive and literally reproductive worker, so that when they die, the bourgeoisie have their children to take their place as cogs in the machine of capitalism. Moreover, the state's exclusion of queerness in education serves to alienate the queers who do arise and to make sure that they are as isolated and alienated as possible, with some schools even revoking the right for queer students to organize. This is an efficacious manner of ensuring that queerness is deemed as unnecessary and abnormal to what a person is supposed to be to be a model worker in society. This is an efficacious manner of ensuring that queerness is deemed as unnecessary and abnormal to what a person is supposed to be in order to achieve this model worker, this model member of the nuclear family that is willing to contribute towards the bourgeois state. The point I am attempting to make here is that since the 19th century, the state has accomplished an impossibly arduous task of ensuring we learn and comply with their model of the perfect student ready to submit their autonomy and identities to capitalism, and to isolate and erase all of those who differ. Of course, education is but one of several tactics the state uses in order to preserve the image of the child for the future. Anti-abortion laws frame women as literal criminals for not offering their bodies and autonomy to the state, with the phrase baby killer used quite often. Anti-immigration advocates use, the, use terms of phrases that imply immigrants simply come to rape and kill innocent children and women. And transphobic speakers continually use the imagery of children being assaulted in the bathroom by a trans person. With this information, it becomes apparent that reproductive futurism and the symbolism of the child serves to promote a proxy of hatred and isolation against all those who pose a threat to the machinations of capitalism. Now that we have analyzed the deployment of the child in the political sphere, it is crucial to draw from real-world examples where the child has been used to justify various atrocities so that we may better understand how to deconstruct the state. During George Bush's speech declaring Operation Desert Storm, he said the following, While the world waited, Saddam Hussein systematically raped, pillaged, and plundered a tiny nation, no threat to his own. He subjected the people of Kuwait to unspeakable atrocities, and among those maimed and murdered innocent children. 
Bush here opposed that the world had to act to stop the atrocity of the Middle East from slaughtering these innocent children, while we know that the actual ulterior motives were far more insidious. This form of rhetoric, coupled with the U.S.'s increasing tensions with the Middle East, allowed for one of the longest and most costly invasions to date, with U.S. soldiers committing these various atrocities overseas, all in the name of the child and the future of democracy and Western civilization. This isn't exclusive to the West, however, and I do not mean to simply frame it as such. In fact, one of the most blatant examples of reproductive futurism used to justify atrocities is in fascist Germany. To better exemplify this, I draw from Baden, a group of anonymous queer nihilists, who cites the usage of the baby's face in Europe as a means of reifying the political support for the fascist groups in Germany and the dissent against political and social minorities. I quote them here. This fascism of the baby's face serves to reify difference and thus to secure the reproduction of the existent social order in the form of the future. No atrocity is out of the question if it is for the child. No horrible project of industry should be precluded if it will serve to hasten the future of industrial civilizations. Armies of men, imperial and revolutionary alike, have always lined up to slaughter in the name of the child. End quote. In the case of Hitler's Germany, the baby served as a form of civility, a form of perfection for the Aryan race that Hitler offered, and he was able to make this radical view much more digestible by plastering the image of the suffering child in a time of economic crisis, and positing that all those who oppose this image of the perfect child represented a German future, such as the Jews, were to be targeted and marked for extermination. These inhumane acts were then justified by the necessity to preserve the child and its beauty in the face of supposed degeneracy and oppression by the Jews, homosexuals, and disabled folks all living in Germany at the time. Even more recently, neo-Nazis and other alt-right groups in the West have justified their actions all in the name of the child, and this is very clear to see simply by reciting the 14 words that most of these fascist groups base themselves upon. We must secure the existence of our people and a future for white children. This most clearly reveals the true purpose of the child and the realm of the political, to promote the erasure of all those who are deemed a threat to the prospect of social status and privilege, which most commonly exists under fields of capitalism. Also quite recently, we have seen the re-emergence of discourse around the predication that trans folk are simply child predators whose entire identities are based upon assaulting innocent children. Here, the child serves to render the identity of queerness inoperable while the state labels it as purely criminal. It goes without saying that politicians do not care about the lives of these children supposedly being threatened by queer folk. Rather, they care about convincing the public that our rights and our autonomy must be revoked in order to stop the destruction of Western civilization, which they then personify in the face of a suffering child. This includes political icons such as Alex Jones claiming drag queens and trans women want to have sex with children and should be cleansed with fire, or Steven Crowder saying children discovering their transness is a form of child abuse. Once again, it's vital to point out that these people aren't concerned with protecting the lives of children, but rather defending the emblematic figurehead of the future against the decadence of Western civilization, a structure, mind you, which greatly privileges the lives of white heterosexuals who constantly promote these kinds of information. The usage of the child here is meant to stack empathy against the trans, queer, non-white, and disabled folk who all seemingly pose a threat to the future of the state. The consequences of reproductive futurism here are apparent in its deployment against queer individuals. And in the face of our erasure under the heel of the state, it seems that our destruction is imminent. And as such, we must react. Reproductive futurism serves as a toxin to queer folk. It actively serves in our ongoing extermination by the state while getting the people to sign on for the ride. So what is our solution? What can we do in the face of totalizing oppression and death? While this subject is debated upon heavily in queer academia, I posit this solution for the time being. That we embrace the roles assigned to us in the destruction of Western civilization. It is crucial that we reclaim our roles as proponents of destruction against neoliberalism and capitalism in order to better suit ourselves and the destruction of a society which seeks to only erase us. 
In the publication of Total Destroy in 2009 by an anonymous group calling themselves a gang of criminal queers, they offer a reclamation of what the state has assigned them. Quote, the machinery of control has rendered our very existence illegal. We've endured the criminalization and crucifixion of our bodies, our sex, our unruly genders. Raids, witch hunts, burning at the stakes. We've occupied the spaces of deviants, of whores, of perverts, and abominations. This culture has rendered us criminal, and of course, in turn, we've committed our lives to crime. In the criminalization of our pleasures, we've found the pleasure to be had in crime. And being outlawed for who we are, we've discovered that we are indeed fucking outlaws. Many blame queers for the decline of this society. We take pride in this. Some believe that we intend to shred to bits this civilization and its moral fabric. They couldn't be more accurate. We're often described as depraved, decadent, and revolting. But oh, they ain't seen nothing yet. End quote. Our assigned role in destroying Western civilization is not just a label. It is a duty. Once our bodies have been assigned the power to corrupt and propel the destruction of Western society, we must not hesitate at the chance to pull the trigger. We are a paradox, a living example of resilience against the future that the state proffers. We do not seek to just destroy the child, we seek to burn it. For as long as there is a state that seeks to prolong the future, queer life will be the first to suffer in the name of its expansion. We must now proudly reclaim our roles as pessimists and anarchists, or be consumed by the state. The machinations of capital have deemed us monsters. And we revolutionary queers take pride in our roles in burning civilization to the ground. While this seems to take a purely negative turn, it's obvious that our only option is to refuse the future, to accept that we must corrupt and destroy all that Western civilization offers as necessary for the sustainment of a civil society. When we fully embrace our purpose in the decadence of modern society, we offer, of course, a purely stateless world. One where queer life is not dominated by the child or the future. A world without time and space to define and divide labor. This is the only world possible for us. One free of civil arrangements of hierarchy and power in all of its forms. Our utmost priority is to forget the future, to abandon the child, and to strive toward the end of hierarchy in its totality by accepting the so-called degeneracy that we embody. The child has dominated the political landscape ever since the emergence of capitalism and liberalism as a better means of controlling the population. Political figureheads coddle this figure or child to promote its conflation with the integrity of Western civilization and the threat that queer folk pose to it. In the face of this insurmountable oppression, there is nothing we can do but embrace our role and be sure that the child and the future of society is destroyed by our very existence or risk being silenced and erased by our oppressors. We are criminals because we exist in opposition to the state. We are deviants because we do not occupy the position of submissiveness. We are whores because our sex does not benefit those who exploit children's labor. We are queer, and we are the reason Western society will crumble.